This was a routine train following its regular route from one Siberian city to another. In the vestibule of the last carriage, a man was smoking a cigarette. As he turned to go back to his compartment, he pulled open the door and stepped into emptiness. A moment later, he found himself lying on the track. There was a crackle of frost in the air. It was 40 below zero, and he was wearing just a T-shirt, sweatpants, and slippers. So began his struggle against extreme cold. Inside this climate chamber, the temperature is 10 degrees below zero. The volunteer has been in there for about half an hour in this experiment. His condition is gradually deteriorating. He's on the verge of the early stages of hypothermia. His body temperature has fallen by about a degree and a half, and a shiver is approaching. Now the second stage follows. His pulse rate will plummet. He'll start shivering uncontrollably. He'll experience a very slow reaction. Blood will gradually be drawn back from his limbs to concentrate around his vital organs brain, heart, lungs, and liver. Blood vessels in the extremities will contract, blocking the blood's access first to fingers, then to arms and legs. The final stage is irreversible hypothermia and death. I will now undress myself immediately because there's a certain adaptation process. Now, I want all of you to go to some warm place as soon as you experience some sort of cold shiver. What could be more bracing than meeting a frosty Sunday morning by sitting in the snow wearing practically nothing? For physiologist Rinard Minvaleev, who practices yoga, it's a normal event. He demonstrates his own method of overcoming the cold. For the other workshop participants, it's something of a feat. Now, it doesn't mean that you immediately stop feeling the cold. You will feel the cold. Your thermoreceptors will be working. The only difference is that you will not feel the cold penetrating your body. With the heat you're emitting, some of you may even be sweating. Why are you out here naked? <laughs> well, that is our task. <laughs> We're even feeling warm. Rinard tries to explain briefly to his students his method for overcoming the cold. He's borrowed some elements from the ancient practices of Tibetan monks. Others come from more modern discoveries in physiology. Rinard believes that with proper breathing and special exercises, a man can survive the extreme cold for up to two and a half hours. Our body cells have a temperature limit, no more than 42 degrees. Therefore, temperature flow is insufficient to warm the whole body. When the body is in a cold environment, it requires a significant amount of heat. This heat can be produced outside of the cells. The most suitable candidate for this role is the lungs, where alveolar sacs can produce large amounts of heat. According to Renard, the lungs help to produce additional heat. When there's a lack of oxygen, known as hypoxia, the process of burning body fat also generates heat. My first thought after the fall was to get up and run. I wasn't that hurt, I had just pulled the muscles in my arm and leg. So I got up, stretched and began to run. I decided to head in the direction of the departing train. I knew that the most important thing was not to freeze. This rare footage from the mid-80s taken by a Soviet documentary crew shows an elderly bearded man in shorts walking through the snow. His name was Parfiri Ivanov founder of a semi-religious doctrine. For the last 40 years of his life, Ivanov wore nothing but shorts, regardless of the season or the outside temperature. Why do I walk in shorts? I believe that anyone in the world can wear just shorts. Shorts are an ephemeral phenomenon. 
But the body, which needs to live and breathe the fresh air, is another thing. I don't want to say that no one can do it. I believe everybody can. They just don't want to, because the body feels cold. And because it feels cold, people try to protect themselves in a physical way. Ivanov believed that the cause of all human disease was people's own delicate natures, because of the fact that they had removed themselves from nature, and that the only way to return to the right way of life was to reject the trappings of civilization including clothes. Cold water is full of life. It is natural. It definitely helps the body generate heat inside. It's not the heat that you have inside clothes. It's heat that comes from the body. Ivanov's cult of the cold received massive exposure before the Soviet Union collapsed and soon after his death. Thousands across the country followed the master's example, walking out in the cold wearing just underwear and pouring cold water over themselves. Sergei Karnokov is not a typical Ivanov follower. He's an entrepreneur, a former high-ranking official, and his wife is a successful fashion designer. They have four children. Sergei believes that he owes his personal well-being to the Ivanov Health Improvement Program. My lungs were almost completely blocked. My heart wasn't working properly. At the same time, there were other health problems too, including allergies and allergy to the cold. An allergy to the cold is the most terrible. When you get your feet wet, you get asthma, and by the time I was 15, I almost got to the point where I simply had no chance of a normal social life. According to Sergei, after he started pouring cold water over himself twice a day, all his illnesses disappeared. You should pour cold water over yourself in the morning and in the evening. When you wake up, you just take a bucket of cold water and pour it over yourself. You should stand on the ground in the winter, right on the snow, and ask for good health for yourself. You need to find the opportunity to be thankful that you are alive. Now, Sergei surprises his neighbors with his daily cold water treatments, which he takes in his backyard along with his whole family. Of course, I've gotten used to it. 23 years is a long time after all. Another thing is that you're going for it not expecting the cold, but the feelings I have now. If you look, you can see that the water evaporates and my body feels really warm now. If I feel comfortable, I can spend an hour here. If I don't feel good, well, I will ask to stop. I never felt completely frozen. I was never involved in extreme activities. Rinard, who was nicknamed Frostman long ago, volunteered to take part in this experiment. Under the supervision of doctors, he'd sit without clothes in a climate chamber at a temperature of around minus 10 degrees for around an hour. 36.8. All right, let's get ready. Yes, I'm ready. This is no art house performance by a famous ballet. It's how the men from a group of winter swimming enthusiasts chose to broaden the scope of their weekly ice cold swim. With this little swan's routine, they've become long standing celebrities at various international winter swimming festivals. We've been doing it for such a long time, it became boring for us just to swim. So we came up with this idea, and it caught on. This routine is about 16 years old. Even older. You can't get used to the cold. You can tolerate it, and you can struggle with it. Here, we're struggling with it, using our body's resources. People who enjoy swimming in icy water are called walruses in Russia. Aficionados swim in sub-zero temperatures, maintaining that cold is a classic example of what doesn't kill you, 
makes you stronger. See my head? I haven't been wearing a hat in winter for the past 20 years now. I've gradually been training my body to the cold and to endure the extreme conditions. Mid-January, the orthodox holiday of the baptism of Christ. The outside temperature is about minus 20, and there are long queues on the riverbank for a large hole in the ice. It's a Russian tradition, open-air swimming to mark this religious day. It's hundreds of years old, and people believe that it's a time when the water requires healing powers. Right now, only 10% of people here swim, and they will go on swimming, while others will still be waiting for the next baptism of Christ. The average person can survive in water in these conditions for no more than a quarter of an hour before fatal hypothermia sets in. When a body is in icy cold water, adrenaline production increases, and once out of the water, there's a spike in endorphin production, causing a sense of euphoria usually felt by the winter swimming walruses just after leaving the cold water. It's similar to a narcotic high. When people come out of the water, if you touch their backs, uh, please come here for a minute. Come here. Touch his back. It's warm. Around the kidneys, it's even hot. So that means when you dip quickly in cold water, it's completely harmless. Thanks. That's what I'm talking about. The climate chamber can help understand how people can survive the cold during winter swimming. The conditions are identical to those that Renard went through. Exposure for one hour to minus 10 degrees. Vitaly Martinov, a winter swimming veteran, has undergone such tests before. The experiment was primarily carried out with Diab Karimov. He just sat in a hole in a fetal position. His arms and legs were crossed, and he was there for about 45 minutes. And I was in the next hole. It was about 10 meters long, so while he was sitting in his hole, I was swimming back and forth in mine for maybe 35 minutes or so. Valery Malkov, who fell out of the train, had only one chance for survival, to reach the nearest station, but he had to move quickly. Wearing nothing but slippers on his feet and without the protection of gloves, his hands immediately began to freeze. The temperature was more than 40 degrees below zero. The temperature outside was minus 45. It was pretty uncomfortable to run along the track. My slippers came off several times. I wasn't afraid of any animal or of death. I didn't even think about the cold. I had just one thought in my mind. Run, run, run. It's impossible to get used to the cold. Cold is elemental. Yes, you definitely can cold an element. You can feel your hands starting to freeze. When it gets dark, you have to feel everything with your fingers. And to do that, you have to take off your mittens. Then, at best, your fingers immediately turn red. But the worst case scenario is that they start to go pale. It's minus 45 degrees Celsius on this polar night, 87 degrees north. The sun won't shine over the horizon for another two months. Russian explorers Matvey Shparo and Boris Smolin are pitching their tent and preparing for another 20 kilometer walk towards the North Pole. We started here at the Arctic Cape, the northernmost point of Russia, 
And then we walked all the way to the North Pole. It's 1,000 kilometers, but because the ice in the Arctic is constantly moving, that 1,000 kilometers ends up becoming one and a half thousand. Shparo and Smolin had to face many challenges during their night walk to the North Pole. Even in such cold conditions, people still sweat. And that's considered to be the main threat to polar explorers because at minus 40 degrees with wind speeds of 20 meters per second, moisture on the skin evaporates quickly, leading to fatal hypothermia 10 times quicker than usual. Also, at such extreme temperatures, the body expends enormous energy simply to maintain its core temperature. We did many calculations over our journey. Every day we ate 5,000 calories worth of food. An ordinary man in an office consumes maybe 2,500 per day. When you eat a piece of bacon, after an hour and a half, maybe two hours, it starts working. It turns into calories, and that's when you feel warm and well. I'm worried that he started to shake uncontrollably. His body temperature is starting to fall. He says he feels okay. Let's get him out of there. The subject believes that he can carry on. The 30 minutes he's already spent in the climate chamber is nowhere near his limit. According to Vitaly Martinov, the fact that he started shivering is the body's normal response to cold, and he could spend at least another half hour in the chamber. But the doctors observing the test were adamant that he should not continue. You don't feel anything at all. If you would stand the cold, apathy sets in, and your brain switches off. I began to freeze almost immediately. After 10 minutes, my feet were really cold. I only had my slippers on. 15 minutes later, I began shivering badly. And after 20 minutes, I just wanted to lie down in the snow and do nothing. In this part of Western Siberia, winter temperatures often reach minus 35 degrees Celsius. Soldiers from Russian Army Special Units deployed here are learning how to fight in the extreme cold. Reconnaissance troop snipers may have to keep almost completely still for hours in the cold. Special uniforms help them to fend off hypothermia. We use various devices, like a multi-layer uniform. The first layer is water-wicking material to prevent the body from sweating. It draws all the moisture from the surface, so the body remains dry. The second layer is fleece material, and the third is a warm jacket and warm pants. Some of these soldiers have been drafted into the army from Russia's southern regions. It took them at least a month to acclimatize to the extreme low temperatures of Siberia. In December, we had the lowest temperature of 48 degrees below. When we go out on field exercises, we try to take fat and grease with us. We spread it over the exposed parts of the body, like hands and face. And physical training takes care of the rest. This is a doer vessel. It contains liquid nitrogen, which has a boiling point of 200 degrees below zero. We can demonstrate by putting a flower into this container. Look what happens to it. OK, let's take it out. And it's frozen solid. Cryotherapy, which has recently become popular in medicine and cosmetology, uses the short-term exposure of skin to very low temperatures. Inside the cryo chamber, liquid nitrogen evaporates, cooling the air to 160 degrees below zero. <laughs> really cold. <laughs> Do you 
feel okay? I am alright. So cold. Is the minute gone? When released from the cryo sauna, the patient feels about the same level of euphoria as the amateur swimmer in icy water. And the physiological impact of temperature shock therapy is also about the same. During the procedure, the cryo sauna creates what we call an air barrier. The heat has nowhere to go, but the skin temperature, yes, it is cooled down to below zero, two degrees below. But this doesn't result in the deep penetration of the cold into the muscles or internal organs. That's why the procedure is for a very limited time. It lasts no longer than three minutes. But during this time, there's a peak in various processes within the body. 55 minutes into the experiment, yogi and physiologist Renard has to perform more of his breathing exercises to slow down the cooling of his body. But gradually the cold takes the upper hand. His body temperature continues to fall steadily and his blood pressure drops. An hour into the experiment and Renard is removed from the climate chamber. He did it. Of course it was my first hour-long test and it was rather extreme. In the end, I felt as though I was reaching the point when I even wanted to stop the experiment. For the first half hour, I felt quite comfortable sitting there. Then, obviously, I was approaching my limit, and somewhere around 45 minutes, I had to stand the cold in my own way. When Renat started feeling the cold, he started to do some exercises with his abdominal muscles and also a particular breathing drill. So in doing that, heat production increased and he had a faster heart rate, which, by the way, went up significantly. Even a layperson can survive extreme cold with no clothes. But instead of using special techniques designed to enable survival, adrenaline and the sheer will to live are what help the body to save itself. Adrenaline, the desire to live and the ability to run the distance without panic. In other words, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he wanted and what he had to achieve. So he survived. He clearly understood that he had to run in exactly that direction. I finally saw the station after half an hour of running. Those last few hundred meters were the hardest for me. When I finally ran up to the duty guard, he looked at me in complete shock. And then he poured me some hot tea and called the police. The newspapers wrote about me. But there's just one thing I really don't understand. Why did they write that I was drunk? I wasn't. I was stone cold sober.